So, of course, the first mandate is the restoration of the tabernacle of David. As, as Patricia shared, the Lord had spoken so strongly. I actually started teaching on the tabernacle of David. This really gives my age away. In 1973. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I remember describing it different places over the years. But God would never let us. It wasn't time yet. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't time yet. And we, we would start prayer things like when we were in Belgium, we had early morning prayer meetings every morning and things like that. But never 24-7 until we came here. Uh, and by that time, it had been from 1973 up to 1999 that I'd been to say, someday God is going to restore the tabernacle of David. And part of that is going to be 24-7 worship and prayer day and night, night and day. And I'd talk about how I could just picture the people coming and, you know, coming with their lunch or what, just saying, how, how was it? And they'd say, oh, it was amazing. God came and we all ended up on the floor before the Lord <laughs> in his presence. And the next watch coming in, how was it? Oh, we had this amazing time and joy broke out and we were just dancing and rejoicing in the Lord. And, you know, it just... Uh, watch after watch and uh, uh, little did I know that someday we would we would be experiencing those kind of things and it's quite quite an amazing thing I'm not going to go into all the scriptures tonight because basically all of you who are in the room and the kind that will watch this video know these scriptures but in Amos 9 uh, verses 11 through 15 of course it talks about the restoration of the tabernacle of David and part of that is the house of David, the throne of David. The other part is how that throne, how that house was established, which was through a tent of 24-7 worship and prayer. The first throne of David, the first kingdom uh, in Jerusalem was established through the prayer and through the worship. When David became king, he was facing an unbelievable challenge. I mean, they had enemies on every side, armies on every side that would come. Philistines would come flooding through the land. And after they'd worked all year, you know, preparing their crops would just take away the crops. And, and he, he was coming uh, into a situation where there was a lot of, of division after King Saul and, and uh, people that were divided rather than united. And he was coming into a city where there were ancient spiritual evil strongholds in this city, and God called him in, but God. And so how do, what do you do in the middle of all of that? You just set up a little tent, <laughs> and you start worshiping, and you start praying, and, and it became, you know, day and night, night and day, and the presence of the Lord was brought back. God is, is said, you know, bring back the ark of the presence and put it in that little tent, and I will dwell here. And when, when this became a dwelling place for God, Suddenly they, not suddenly, but over a period of years, his throne was established. They had peace with all of their enemies. They had enemies who were beginning to bring tribute rather than stealing from them. Uh, when we first moved here, the first place where we started Sukkot Allah was over on Aminadav. Uh, some of you were there. And um, uh, in our landlord is a famous archaeologist. And uh, she told us the story one day how archaeologists all said there could never have been a king as great as the Bible describes King David to be. There could never have been a King David like that. The Bible must be wrong because if he was such a great king, we would find evidence written in stone about this king. And all we have are the, are the parchments, are the, the scrolls, the written things about King David in the Bible. But we don't have any... any uh, physical proof written in stone as it would have been at that time. And our landlord, who was not a believer in God, was leading a team up north in Galilee. And guess what they discovered? They discovered a special uh, you know, stone, marble stone, that had inscribed, bringing tribute to the great King David in Jerusalem. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't just, you know, his name happened to be on a stone. It was bringing tribute from another nation to the great King David in Jerusalem. So that kind of settled that argument after that. That, uh, that, uh, that was clear. So the tabernacle of David, he said in Amos 9, would be restored. And he gives us a, a very clear clue as to when it would be restored. Uh, and that there will be uh, a great 
harvest he talks about. But he, at the end of that, those few verses, he says, and in that day I will bring my people back in Israel, back into their own land, never again to be uprooted. And some of you will remember dear Michael Cohen, who was part of us and who uh, had a revelation from the Lord to look up one day about what happened on Independence Day, uh, which was, uh, you know, two weeks earlier than it was originally scheduled to be. So because they knew there were armies planning to attack and they wanted to quickly uh, make this statement. And it was on a Friday. He looked up the date and he found out it was a Friday. When he looked that up, you can find out what was the parasha, what was the reading read in synagogues on any Friday way of the future or any Friday way back, as Martin continually reminds us <laughs> in a wonderful way like tonight. And it's so uh, prophetic. So it was on a Friday after they signed the Declaration of Independence in uh, in what's now called Independence Hall in Tel Aviv, many of them would have gone to synagogue because it was Friday afternoon. And when they came, Michael Cohen said, I wonder what they would have heard when they came in. And he found out it was not just a yearly par parasha, but it was a passage that was read uh, only on certain special years. And, and when they came in, here's what they would have heard in that day, I will restore the fallen tabernacle of David. <laughs> and then you're going on through about how they possess the remnant of Edom, which I believe is a, a picture of great revival among the Edomites. It's a picture of, of Middle East uh, outpouring of God in many ways. And, and the nations that are called by my name. And then he says the hills will drip with new wine. It's just a great harvest. The plowman will, will overtake the harvester. They, they, it, no longer do you wait a long time for a harvest. So we're going to see, Milad, we're going to see great harvest in Bethlehem. Where, where, where we're not you know, just waiting for one every few months to come to the Lord. We're going to see great harvest here in, in Jerusalem, where we're not just waiting every few months for someone to come to the Lord. But we, can't, we won't be able to keep up with what will happen from what he says in Amos 9, when that tabernacle of David is restored. And then he gives us the clue. It will happen in the time when I bring my people back from the nations, from exile, planting them once again in their own land, never again to be uprooted. Now, if we can look at the next slide here, uh, this is obviously the prayer room, and I just want to thank the Lord. Uh, in November, we celebrated 15 years of 24-7, day and night, night and day, 365 days a year, one 168 hours in every week <laughs> that need to be filled by a human being <laughs> worshiping and lighting the menorahs over here. One of the things the Lord spoke early on to Patricia was this menorah and lighting it by hand, not getting, you know, one of these electric ones or something, but lighting it by hand is a symbol that the fire on the altar should never go out. That there were people who walked up with their hand and lit that menorah, lit that candle. How many have lit a candle here at some time? Okay. <laughs> Almost everyone in the room has lit a candle at one time or another here. We're part of the fire on the altar. It's a, a, just a beautiful prophetic picture of that. So we thank the Lord for that. Another thing is the encouraging and training of all the other altars of worship in the land. Uh, teams that are going out at the top here is a team of kids who were 11, 12, 13, and 14 years old. And help me, here. I think it was two years ago, two, 2000, no, three now, 2017. This was in Rishon Lezion. Uh, some of you know Pastor Mickey from there. He'd come up here, and somehow he found out about the kids' watch, and he saw uh, the middle school age watch, the 11, 12, 13, 14-year-old kids. And he saw how they were worshiping the Lord, and he said, is there any way you can bring those kids to Rishon Lezion? I want them to teach our kids that our kids can worship now. They don't have to just play games. They could, they could actually worship the Lord. They could learn to lead worship. And so we got down there, and, and it, um, how can I say, it, we, we were thinking that it was just a group of his kids to hear a group of our kids. And when we got there, they had the whole congregation, the adults there. And here were these 11, 12, 13, 14-year-old kids thinking, you know, we're going to lead 30 minutes of worship and prayer with these other kids and then be with them. And then they asked them if they could go on. I, I think it was like an hour and a half, <laughs> two hours. And, and these little kids did it. They, I mean, it was amazing. But it's wonderful that, you know, as, as the generations go on. Uh, actually, we were there Friday morning in Rishon Lezion. Uh, they have had pastors meeting together now. About 11 pastors have been meeting every week at 530 in the morning on Thursdays to pray together 
for their city and their area. And now they rented a facility, and Patricia and I were able to pray over the prayer room and dedicate the prayer room this last Friday morning in Rishon Lezion with vision for 24-7 in Rishon. <laughs> so it's grown out of that little group there. And then on Saturday, it was such a blessing. We were, uh, I think the, the one down here is with Arab young people. Uh, it may have been in the city of Jerusalem and a team of many of the young adults here together with Tal who were uh, ministering to Arab young people in worship. So Saturday, uh, you know, this right before the, it's just interesting how this worked out timing-wise. Friday, and no, let's see, Friday from Rishon in the morning, we drove in the afternoon and ministered to Arab women that Rania had gathered, uh, about 80 women or so, and 80 or 90 women. And then uh, the next day, it was about 50 young people and it was so exciting when that team got up, they were quite young, and they really worshipped it. It was just so powerful. And then the, the young lady who had led the worship came up to me, and she says, I just want you to know, I know, I know Bethany, I know Tal. And she said, I, I thought I could not sing. I, she said, I didn't know I could sing until I went to Dor Haba to the youth training. And she said, there I found out that I could sing. She has this gorgeous voice. It was like, how did you not know, <laughs> know this? And then she said, and I didn't know I could write a song. And there was a, a little workshop on writing songs. And I, wrote, I realized I could write a song. And she sang a song uh, there, led a song that she'd written that was just so anointed in Arabic about the arrow of the Lord and the Lord fashioning us as his arrows. And uh, the, the kids were just really responding to the song she'd written. So we're so thankful for these teams of some of the young adults have been going out different places and uh, strengthening altars of worship, not only in other countries, but, but here in the land, it's really important. And, and so we're thankful that uh, they've been able to go to places like Jerusalem and um, uh, in the old city and Bethlehem and, and um, help me, Nazareth. And, and uh, there's one coming up at Haifa, I know. And, uh, yeah. So it's just, it, you know, there are places one after the other that have, are opening up. And, and so we thank the Lord for that.